Hey, welcome back uh, to the Ye old Foundry. Uh, I had started off another segment just a second ago, but the battery was dead as a doornail. Heaven knows why. I usually don't let them run down like that. Anyway, so here we are. I am going to make an uh, attempt to explain to everybody how the Navy molder uh, repaired Babbitt bearings. Okay. Now the beginning of this whole set of thing is going to be me uh, doing a little background information and leading up to the uh, invention of the the Babbitt bearing. You know, it's going to be like some of the other ones that you might have watched uh, when I first put out. Went way back in time and worked my way forward and eventually got around to uh, the point I was trying to make so that you could see, uh, you know, make all the connections, uh, however vague they might have been, to the subject matter I was, I was uh, starting to work with. Okay, so right after I sign off here, I'm going to start off with, uh, you know, the little lesson, the little history lesson. And then after that, I'm going to uh, explain step by step what we did as, as Navy molders to re-Babbitt Babbitt bearings, okay? Now, this I'm not going to be able to do this video like I usually like to do with the videos. You know, it, when we went to college, in the, at the community college, um, it was a technical college. The basic thing was is that you would go into the classroom, be taught the subject matter, and then go to the lab, lab, uh, well, whatever kind of lab it might have been, and uh, you know, do your practical uh, applications of the information that you were, you know, just taught. Okay, for instance, when I was uh, at the uh, Thames Valley State Technical College in the middle to later latter 80s, I was the only one there. Ooh, I just hit my microphone. I hope that didn't kill your ears. I, I was the only molder in the group, okay? So I was the only one that really had an easy time of that section of the curriculum that had to do with making molds and pouring molten metal, okay? I was kind of, I kind of cheated, okay? So I was taking a basic course and I, and I could have taught a more, you know, advanced course in that, in that technical college but I was happy that, that at least for one time, you know, the subject matter I was fully aware of. I was fully cognizant of. Not calculus. There was times when I, when I took that calculus test, or rather the, took the calculus class, I was up to 2 o'clock in the morning trying to make heads or tails of all the information that they were sending me. Uh, or, you know, the subject matter, the, the chapter, whatever lesson it was they was giving me, took me hours. Okay? Just not, my brain is just not wired for math as good as others. Um, so I was very happy to be able to help other people in this case with, uh, you know, that subject. Unfortunately, you know, just, uh, even though I, I like the learning the basics first and then doing it in the uh, lab and getting the practical applications down, we can't do it this time. I live in suburbia. There is no industrial areas that I can I can you know take scrap from. There is no I can't I can't go rooting out in piles of of thrown away mechanisms and and uh, you know for instance in this case bearings. There is no place for me to get a half of a bearing um, to be able to show you how to cast a bearing. Not only that, I don't have the Babbitt. I don't have tin. I do have the, the, uh, the stuff to clean the surface of the bearing, the, the, the bearing shell, I mean. And I can make the other stuff, some of the other stuff. But I just don't have all that stuff. I, I apologize. If you were waiting for uh, actual hands-on, uh, showing, showing you hands-on how to do it. I'll do my very best, though, 
uh, by way of explanation and pictures that I found online that'll illustrate the points that uh, I'm trying to make for you. It's not rocket scientists, really, okay? If you went and uh, watched the one of uh, the videos that had to do with, uh, you know, pouring uh, wire rope sockets, it's uh, closer to that than anything else that I've sewn. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be cleaning the item, the bearing shell. You'd be melting out the old metal, okay? Uh, you'd have to scrape that all out while it's in its molten state, clean that bearing shell expertly, put it together on a, uh, on a jig, you know, so that when you pour the molten metal, the molten metal isn't going to flow everywhere. You know, it, it has to uh, conform to a inner curvature and make it just so thick. Usually I think we had them three-eighths of an inch, half an inch, half inch of material in there we pour it off and that's how much that much uh, actual babbit we would have attached to the bearing shell you know just to give the machinists the machinist mates or rather the machinist repairmen uh, enough to work with to machine it down to the clearances that it was supposed to have um, some of those th some of the things that I'll, I'll be talking about will would help you in that area okay so some things that you know that you would never know by reading the book, okay? Things that we developed in the Navy. Uh, techniques, schedule, you know, uh, information that uh, we didn't really, of course nobody ever needed it, so we didn't pass it on to anybody else. But most molders uh, learned how to do these things, and uh, some enjoyed it, some didn't. I would have enjoyed it. You know, it was quite, quite the challenging uh, job that we had to uh, pour molt, or rather pour Babbitt into bearing shells and uh, you know make certain that it that it stuck real good on there but uh, NDT non-destructive testing in the Navy had such high requirements for bond I mean I think they might have been between 85 and 90 percent bond requirement throughout the surface, if you took the surface, the inside surface of the uh, bearing shell, laid it flat, and they made a, uh, a flat representation, and they would, they would go along with their, uh, what was it, sonic, uh, sonic, yes, it was the, the sound, uh, Jesus, I'm not even, sonic, it was, so, it would sound, okay, they measured it by sound. Uh, they, it would show you where there was a very good bond, and then it would show you where bo bad, you know, bond wasn't there, or it was bad bond. Okay. Now, in the old days, they didn't have people, you know, to do that. So what the uh, old machinists used to do, machinist mates in the navy used to do, is that in the curvature of the bearing. They would, they would machine a dovetail groove, okay? Or if they wanted to, you know, even even less um, tech, uh, less sophisticated technique, they would simply drill holes in the bearing shell, uh, making anchors, okay? Uh, and most of the time that worked. It, it was nowhere near you know, the strength uh, that a bond of the bearing and the shell would be if you had a good bond, okay? It's, uh, it's, like, it's like if you're a carpenter or a woodworker, you know how strong it is where they glue the two pieces of the uh, board together. You do it proper uh, and you let it dry properly let it cure properly you won't be able to pull that apart you will rip the you know the, the wood apart trying to get down to that place where you just bonded all that you glued all that okay same thing would be for the babbitt on a bearing shell okay that was the whole idea that's the reason why the uh, non-destructive testing lab 
uh, wanted us to be that much better at getting the bond throughout and uh, and we tried our, our hearts out. We, we worked really hard on it and we would get very good bond almost everywhere but sometimes no matter what you did it failed NDT and we'd have to do it over again. That's where I, I, I started getting disgusted at, at it. You know, it, it would have lasted decades but NDT failed it because it was maybe five or six percent uh, down from the the bond required for that. I mean, you got to have your cat, you got to have your uh, qualifications, and and it didn't qualify as being a good bond. Uh, well, I guess you uh, practice makes perfect. You know, we didn't do that many Babbitt bearings. The ones that really killed us was the main line shaft bearings. Now picture this. Now I'm going to show you the pictures throughout this lecture, but but remember when, uh, when I mentioned this, the line shaft bearings were 36 inches. If you laid them up, if you stood them up on edge, they were 36 inches tall, and the inside diameter of a finished uh, line shaft bearing was 13 inches. Let's say that big around. Okay, I was able to get inside the shell, pick it up, and my body was inside the shell, you know, where the pieces would come together, where that, that plane was. I was able to get my body in there. That's how big, the, big it was for us. And when you pour those, the bottom half of it is solid Babbitt, okay? The top half of it, the top half of it had four pads that you poured. The pads being, let's say, that tall by that thick, and the inside, the ones on the inside, away from the edges, was, ooh, let's say, went from here to here, you know, only, only about three quarters of the width of the inside of the curvature of the uh, bearing shell. The ends, the part that, that you would seal up with seals, they, that went all the way from the edge of the babbit on the bottom part all the way over to the edge of the bottom on the bottom part, okay? So you had full pads on, on the ends and inside you had support pads that were maybe three-fourths the curvature of the inside, okay? They were big. And if anything was wrong with the casting, and now I'm talking the bearing shell, those were castings made in this foundry someplace, okay? It doesn't take very much imagination to realize that if they didn't do 100% good work on their casting, there just might be a, a portion in that casting that is nothing but bad metal, okay? not pure metal. They, they might have had a, a chunk of uh, slag fall in there and it get put in there and, and get disguised by a nice, uh, machining by the uh, machine shop, all right? If it's slag, it's oxide. If it's oxide, it isn't going to be uh, cleaned good enough for the, uh, the Babbitt to be able to be, uh, you know, attached or, or, you know, bonded to that metal. Uh, and that's where a problem came in. Uh, let's say 80% of the time, we wouldn't have any problems. It would all, it would all pass NDT and it would go, but there was, there was times where we would have to redo it again. Aside from the time we had one of the machine shop people, when he, he was in charge of making, you know, making the clearances in there to machine out the excess Babbitt, he did it too much. We had to redo it again. That was unconscionable to us in the foundry. That just means we had to do it again, all over again. And when we had to do those big ones like that, that was a 36, a 36 hour day. You didn't get to put it in the oven, go take a nap, come back, check on it, take a nap, come back. You know, you had to be there and you had to watch things so nothing went wrong, okay? So that, that's, that was a bad thing for us. Uh, thankfully, we didn't do it that many times, and usually it was only either the uh, the tenders we were on needed to have their 
their line shaft bearings replaced down in the shaft alley or a uh, the line shaft bearings for one of the aircraft carriers that was near us uh, needed to have it done you know they that's how big they were the shafts for the ships that's how big they were so bearings wasn't my favorite job uh, but nevertheless I did say in the beginning of these <clears throat> pardon me these videos that I was going to cover this also as as you know illustrating one of the jobs that we were the we in the Navy molders was uh, responsible for and uh, unfortunately I can't show you how to do it because I don't have everything I'm going to do the best I can to try and show you verbally and show you by illustration uh, how to do it but that's going to have to be as good as I can get it uh, maybe someday in the future somebody will send me a small bearing and then I'll be able to do it then I mean a small bearing where maybe the shaft is what no more than four inches okay that doesn't mean I want everybody in the freaking world to send me bearings for crying out loud but um, even then I would have to still I'd still have to uh, send for the Babbitt I'd still have to send for the tin I'd have to make a tin stick uh, mold uh, that I'll cover a little bit later um, there's lots of stuff I would have to do to be able to pour it it would be uh, but it would be in it'd be demonstrated well if if, if I had a place around here where I could go find one the right size to uh, illustrate what it looks like anyway so after this I'll be going I'll be uh, you know putting on the uh, verbal you know information I'll, you know and above it or covering it it'll be pictures to illustrate what I'm talking about okay I'll see you in a little while. Before I start, you should know that the dates and years that are about to be mentioned are taken from anthropological and archaeological sources. I'm not here to authenticate these dates and times, and you should know that some of these events are leaps of logic from my own imagination. Approximately six million years ago, there is evidence that indicates that the soon-to-be humans of the time started walking upright. At this time, humans were still more ape-like than the humans we know today. And a great deal of the time, their lives were spent in the trees out of the reach of local carnivores. Just like the primates in the jungles today, most of their time was spent looking for food. Most of the food that they ate was on plants, so whenever they were traveling about, they would always be looking for food and keeping their eyes open for the local meat-eaters. When they were on the ground, they usually they were usually surrounded by tall grasses, so they got into the habit of standing upright on their two legs so that they could see over the grasses and hopefully catch sight of a lion or leopard that might be stalking the group. Approximately 3.4 million years ago, there is evidence that humans were using tools, not only to hunt animals and skin them, but to more efficiently harvest the raw materials that the animals had within their bodies, such as bones and ligaments, that could be used to make far more effective tools and weapons. At this time, however, it was still very difficult for humans to hunt efficiently, as most of them were solitary hunters or hunters coming from single family groups. So while they still ate meat, most of their diet still consisted of what was grown out of the ground or in the trees. During this time, humans started to turn away from plant foods and started to turn, turn towards meat as part of their diet. In doing so, humans not only got a better source of protein from, for their bodies, but they were also forced to become more intelligent than the animals they were hunting. Just as you will make your muscles bigger if you work them hard, the humans of the time started to be born with bigger brains due to their increased usage and better protein source. 
One can assume that humans first started to eat meat when they happened upon the animal's corpse or a victim of a carnivore, and they helped themselves to the meat. In time, humans found that if they picked up a rock and hit an animal with a rock with sufficient force, it would kill the animal, and the animal would then become a meal. Over time, humans became dependent on the weapons they developed to become a more effective hunter. Approximately 2.6 million years ago, the Ice Age starts. The accumulation of ice on the surface of the Earth not only reduced the area of habitation for the animals of the time, it also affected the weather patterns making dry areas wetter and wet areas dry out. Approximately 2 million years ago, humans made meat a high priority when hunting and gathering. Now keep in mind that humans of the time were all still in Africa, and they would never would have left Africa if it wasn't for the development of tools and weapons that not only made their lives safer, having the ability to kill or drive off carnivores, and having improved their diets so much that family groups could live longer and grow bigger. Between 50,000 years and 100,000 years ago, some of the humans of the time left Africa and spread out over the parts of Europe and Asia that wasn't covered with glacial ice. Ice placed there by the still very active ice age. Why did the, they leave Africa having been there for millions of years? Well, it's not necessarily because they were curious about what was over the next hill. It was more likely that the food sources were being depleted by so many family groups continuing to grow and develop through better diets and better safety. Once the animals started leaving the area or all were killed and the plant life was eaten up, a strong motivation to move to more plentiful hunting grounds was introduced into the consciousness of the humans. Approximately 20,000 years ago, the Ice Age ended and the ice began to retreat. All this heavy ice melting and retreating removed a great deal of weight from the shell of the earth in which it had traveled. This allowed the earth to slowly but surely return to its normal inclination and to allow the weather cycles that existed before the ice age to return to their normal patterns. Now when I speak inclination I'm talking about the angle at which the uh, axis of the earth you know was aimed and around which the earth rotated okay when it was uh, the ice age all that ice was in a place where it made the uh, the axis tilt okay and allowed the uh, that area to get colder and colder and to accumulate more and more ice once that ice started retreating it was able to go back to the the attitude or inclination that the axis was at first or before that ice age. Approximately 11,500 years ago, some bright member of a tribe discovered that if he planted a seed in the ground, the food that they came to search for would be grown where they were. So because of this, humans suddenly became anchored to a spot where agriculture was developed, and because they were apt to stay in this spot, herding was also developed. Obviously, Family groups having to stay in one spot for a long time started to develop dwellings and corrals in which their families could stay and their meat sources could be contained. <coughs> Pardon me. At the 11,000 year mark, developing villages was in full swing and because the herders took their animals to different grazing fields around the area, some herder with good eyes discovered copper outcroppings, ushering in the age of copper. It should be noted that as far back as the development of the very first weapon or tool, anything that humans wanted to keep in their possession they had to carry. They had not developed anything yet that they could use to carry their worldly goods. When it came time to move to a new area, everything they needed for their existence was carried. The rest was left where where it was built. Like, for instance, their, their dwellings that they, they lived in. 
until approximately 6,000 years ago when evidence suggests that humans captured and domesticated oxen. After this, the next development could be advanced. I think you can see a pattern here. The most recent developments in human advancement couldn't have happened before some other development happened, and so forth and so on to the dawn of human consciousness. Even today, we can see that the computer couldn't have been developed were it not for the invention of the microprocessor. The invention of Teflon wouldn't have happened were it not for the needs of the space race, and so on. Once the oxen were domesticated, now humans had a stronger creature that could be used to move thing, heavier things. At first they tried to just pile things on the back of the oxen, and that worked for a time, but that still limited the oxen to carrying what they could physically keep from falling to the ground. Soon someone developed the sled, which, was, which allowed great weights to be transported from point A to point B, an invention that the uh, Egyptians used to transport heavy stone blocks over land to build the pyramids and to transport the obelisks that they you know, eventually made upright and buried in the land. Per the writings from archaeologists studying both buildings made by Egyptians and by the more primitive endeavors by people around the world like the stones that made up Stonehenge, the sled was used as a platform upon which heavy stones sat and then a road of worked wooden slats were placed from the location that the stones were delivered to the place where the stones would be set. Now I say wooden slats, it's almost like somebody took a, uh, a bunch of two by fours, cut them to the right width, planted them into the ground, or uh, you know, laid them on the ground, and uh, made a kind of a road going from point A to point B. Once the trail or road was in place, the road was covered in a layer of clay after which the clay was moistened and the slick clay surface was ready for the sled to be pulled by the oxen. Anybody who's ever worked with clay knows that as soon as you get it wet, it's not only sticky, but it's real, real slick. Okay? And so they took advantage of that slick part and the fact that it would stick to the wood uh, to move the heavy stuff over land. And this is the way that the heavy things were transported until someone else developed the very first bearing. Now, we know this bearing, despite its being in its infancy and a bit crude, as a roller bearing. Of course, today, then, it, uh, or of course, back then, it didn't have the kind of upper race and lower race we recognize as necessary on today's roller bearings, but it did in fact have a form of roller, uh, or rather a form of upper race, known as the sled, and a form of lower race, uh, the ground over which the rollers ro moved, uh, period. The roller, parts of the ancient roller bearing, originally was made up of wood, most likely the trunks of small trees or the limbs of larger trees. Moving forward, their very first wheel was invented approximately 5,500 years ago. But it wasn't used as a mode of transportation at the time. The very first wheel was the potter's wheel that the potters in, uh, for, for any particular village would use to be able to make pottery and shape clay or useful items used by the local people. As soon as tin was discovered and bronze shortly thereafter, approximately 5,200 years ago, the wheel was developed for transportation. Now this only happened because bronze being harder than copper made for harder tools and could with precision, that's the key, make the holes and shafts required for wagon wheels. Now they could have had, uh, you know, shafts and, and wagon wheels uh, earlier than that, but because they weren't able to, you know, precisely make a round hole. Imagine trying to drag uh, something over the, the land on wheels that were all offset. You might as well just leave it on, on the, uh, the sleds. Well, with all the banging and slamming that they would have been, 
you know, those wheels wouldn't have lasted for nothing anyway. For any time. Um, okay, so the only reason why they made wheels is because they made better tools and they were able to make nice round holes and make nice round shafts uh, so that things stayed smoother. You know, they traveled smoother over land. Note, the simplest form of bearing, as I've researched, is known as the plane bearing, P-L-A-N-E, bearing, and is characterized by a shaft turning inside a hole, uh, just like uh, the shaft, or rather like a the shaft of a uh, wagon wheel's sh an uh, axle. There we go, that's the word I was looking for like the shaft of an axle going inside the wagon wheel, you know, the hole of the wagon wheel. That was uh, the ba plain bearing. Having worked with wood for thousands of years, man turned to wood as the material to be used in the development of this new invention. It was soon discovered that where the two pieces of wood met each other, Friction soon wore down the wood, making the wheel or axle un unusable. Uh, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch of the imagination to realize that they, they would search for harder and harder and harder wood and may have eventually found uh, at, you know, oak in Europe and then the uh, wheels lasted longer and longer. But you still had friction, so you had to make something that would keep the two pieces of wood from tearing each other apart as they traveled over land. Various and sundry materials were tried to lessen the friction, but eventually a grease made from rendered fat was used as a lubricant. Now that's about as far back in time as I want to go as an introduction to the subject of bearings. Uh, now I'm going to turn to the subject of Babbitt bearings. Of course, there are dozens of different types of bearings in the world, such as ball bearings, roller bearings, thrust bearings, and so forth. But most of those bearings are made of hardened steel nowadays and were developed relatively recently. Babbitt bearings, or the alloy that made up Babbitt, was developed in the year 1839 by the inventor Isaac Babbitt here in the United States. Per the submitted patent, his material was designed to resist galling. Okay? If friction was applied and if the production of heat was hot enough, the tin part of the tin alloy would melt and become a liquid upon which the rotating part would float and be supported for a short time. Uh, one would in one would think that uh, the the great deal of heat that would be required to make the tin remain molten should probably you know move through the mechanism and something else would fail and stop it from rotating, but I can't imagine how hard it would be for that machine once that tin uh, melted and became a liquid. Uh, you know it would be coating whatever was rotating through it and turn off the machine, let it cool down, and at least a portion of that rotating, whatever it is, whether it be an axle or, a, or whatever, uh, would be embedded in that, you know, what used to be molten tin. Must have been a hard time. Anyway, the bearing surface normally has a clearance machine to it, into it, you know. In reality, this bearing material is never really supposed to meet or touch the rotating portion of the machinery. The bearing surface normally has a clearance machined into it, as I said before, which m it makes a gap between the bearing and the moving part that will allow a layer of oil to fill the gap at the lowest pressure of the uh, lowest level rather of the bearing, and it's that oil that will act as a support and lubricant for the moving part. The only time that the moving parts would ever likely come in contact with the bearing material, the babbit, is if the mechanism wasn't properly maintained and the oil was leak, had leaked out past the seals. Keep in mind that this type of bearing was developed taking advantage of fluid dynamics and the fact 
that liquids, in this case the lubricant, resist compression. However, some mechanics, being very dependable, will you know, inadvertently allow the oil to drain from beneath the rotating part of the machine and will allow the machine to ruin the bearing by way of friction. In other words, it happens. This is where the United States Navy molder came in. It was very likely that the reason why we in the foundry were assigned the responsibility to repair Babbitt bearings was because we were the ones who had equipment that could routinely melt metal. Uh, our furnaces, for instance, our metal pots, or like our tin pots, our lead pots, you know, you could just uh, melt out, or rather uh, pour out the lead or and, and clean out the, uh, the pot and then put the Babbitt in there bring that up to the proper temp and then that would be ready for you to pour them the, the bearings okay so we can kind of get the idea of why they would have given it to us rather than like for instance the uh, pipe fitters or any of the other folks that have torches I don't know the real reason behind the original decision because by the time I joined the Navy in 1971 that responsibility had already been assigned to the molders well I hope that <clears throat> provided you with a little bit of uh, perspective on how things may or may not have gone back in the old days, way old days. Okay? <clears throat> and thank you for sitting through that. If you're actually watching this portion, you're much, much more braver than, much braver, you're more braver, yes, more braver braver than uh, a, a whole lot of other people but uh, I, I whenever I try to hit, hit a subject I try to put it in perspective to today's world and without you knowing at least a little bit about Babbitt bearings and how they were how they were designed or how they were developed uh, my putting out a, a video on actually repairing a bearing like that it would uh, kind of be worth uh, worthless, okay? No interest. It wouldn't be interesting at all. So, okay. Now here's this is the kind of the wrap up for this for this um, video or for this segment of the subject. I'll say there's been a lot of people out there who's been shown that if you were to uh, cast a you know you you put you got your shaft and you got your lower bearing and your upper bearing you know Babbitt bearings and if you just you know you just smoke the shaft putting a a layer of carbon around the shaft that uh, when you put the bearings together and you seal the sides and you pour the molten Babbitt in the top that once you get done and you're able to pull that apart and all that everything will work great they might and they might not. The problem is, is that those things are, like I said before, they're designed to ride, you know, have the, have a layer of oil underneath the shaft, and the layer of oil is what supports, uh, that's what the shaft rides on. The friction that is formed with that union, uh, the oil, you know, takes the heat away from the shaft, and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll get, get rid of it, and over a, t a certain amount of time, you're going to have to replace the oil, and uh, hence the reason why a lot of a lot of the bearings fail is because when uh, you know the people don't put more oil in periodically to replenish what might have been burned up over time, especially on a machine like a big saw or a planer, any of those that might be used for a extended amount of time on a large project. Okay, if uh, you you put seals on the sides of these uh, that's like a packing gland kind of seals uh, if they start if the packing starts shrinking and the uh, you know because of uh, some of the oil uh, turning to uh, vapor and going away well the va the packing glands are going to you know, not have the oil in there to keep it sw swollen anymore and your, your oil is going to go away the, the shafts are then going to come in direct contact with the Babbitt material 
and it'll ruin it, okay? Friction will ruin those Babbitt uh, bearings and they won't wor work nearly as well as, the, uh, as they're supposed to when they're nice and smooth and, they're, and the Babbitt itself is supporting a layer of oil which, which supports the shaft or the rotating portion of that machinery. Um, so here's the problem with just smoking it. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have that the inside Babbitt curvature form to that shaft, which is which is very good, but you're not gonna have any gap in there for the oil to get down in there. You'll have a small film, maybe, get in there, uh, but the film isn't going to be like a layer. It's not going to be like a pool. Uh, that's going to have enough room in between the Babbitt and the and the rotating rotating shaft. <clears throat> I'm going to assume it's a rotating shaft for for the uh, you know for this moment. And uh, you know it'll it'll still burn up. Okay, you, you'll you'll make the uh, lubricant go away real quick if it's only a like a hair's width of a gap down there. A couple three thousands that ain't going to help it. You know it. Um, I'm not well. I'm not a machinist, mate, or rather a machinist repairman either, and I don't have at uh, you know at first hand what the clearances are supposed to be, supposed to be uh, between a bearing surface and a rotating shaft. Uh, you'd have to research that, but if you do cast the Babbitt bearings around a shaft, that's that's a good thing to have. As your starting point, okay, take those bearing shells then and give them to a machine machinist to give yourself into to machine to bore that out and give yourself a gap in there for the oil. Okay, whatever the clearances are supposed to be, you'll have to find that out. And uh, then the odds are really good that that bearing is going to give you decades of use. Okay, most of the uh, bearings that were ever given to us to replace had been in that machine or you know that device for decades okay because they they were taking good care of it and keeping the lube uh, level up right so yeah it's a it's a, a valuable uh, technique to know that you can put a layer of carbon on a shaft and then cast the Babbitt bearings around it, but that shouldn't be the last move you make, okay? Aside from also you know, on the top half of the bearing, you've got to put grooves in there and crisscrosses in there to allow the oil that's coming in through the top to distribute and then pour down around the, the shaft and then settle down into the bottom half where the gap is supposed to be, okay? There's things that you need to do after the, the uh, Babbitt bearing is, is cast, okay? Uh, that, I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell you that that's a bad thing to cast it around a shaft, but it's a bad thing if you don't do anything else, all right? In addition, there's been some people that I know that I've watched take that uh, like a long, there was a long bearing, let's say that long, we're pretending that long, that was clamped around the shaft that they had smoked, clamped around the shaft, they put some stuffing on the ends so the bearing, you know, the Babbitt bearing uh, material wouldn't uh, come out right away and that, by the way, is the, the, the rottenest part of this whole job is that if you don't make certain that every little tiny crack and crevice and, and a hole isn't plugged with something that's nice and strong as soon as you start pouring that bearing after all those steps of getting rid uh, getting it ready that stuff starts leaking out all you can do is hope that you've got a, like a, a wet uh, rag that you can throw onto it, the spot where it's coming out and you keep pouring it because you can't stop pouring it once you start. All right? You can't stop. Um, if, you, you, if you have a layer, you have a go, 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 stop, it solidifies a little bit, then you start again, you're going to have a split in there where it's, you know, there's a layer of, of Babbitt and a layer of Babbitt and an oxide layer in there. That is uh, a reject. 
you know, for the bearing itself. So you can't stop pouring once you stop uh, start pouring. So a great deal of effort is put into sealing all the all the all the portions of the uh, the edges of the ba bearing shell that might leak by, and uh, you know it's got. Don't forget, it's got to whatever you use. Uh, it's got to be uh, able to be used when you heat things up. I myself, I'm going. If I ever get, ooh, sorry about that. If I hurt hurt your ears, I keep forgetting I've got this thing now. Anyway, if uh, if you start heating it up and it's not able to to be flexible enough to stay still and it pulls away from one of the surfaces that you just shoved it in, your stuff is going to leak. So you gotta you gotta make a nice uh, like fire clay mud. You know, what we, we used to do, <clears throat> whenever we were making a mud, and not buying a, a, a civilian product, but we made a mud, we would take a handful of fire clay powder, okay, and, well, in the bad days, we'd take a half, a, uh, we'd take a handful of asbestos flake, Okay. Now, yeah, this was really loose asbestos, and it, and the little stuff was all in the air when you put it, you know. Hence, the uh, they, they they the Navy did good by us, and they got rid of uh, the asbestos as soon as they figured out that it was uh, it could cause lung cancer. But for those of us who who had used it, it was a little bit too late. Uh, but the guys after us, they they pretty much were saved. Thank goodness. Anyway, so there's there's materials you can use. Uh, the asbestos flake was used for its fibrous material, okay, to try and keep the uh, the fire clay from just splitting when when the heat was applied to it, okay. So if you find, oh, uh, well, let's say a fiberglass uh, kind of material that uh, is not bothered by heat so much, okay. Uh, look for uh, putty or look for uh, uh, sealing material to be used for steam plants. Okay, something that's that's uh, really malleable and that you can you can use it to seal up uh, places in a boiler. Right, something very hot. Not that you won't have to be necessarily as hot as uh, like a furnace. Okay. Uh, because you're not going to be you're not going to be making this thing any hotter than like 900 degrees thereabouts. I'll give you the right temperatures when I get on this next video. The uh, and uh, speaking of the next video, okay, it'll happen a few days from now. Uh, I've got other little projects to get done. This is just the beginning of this subject, though. Um, the the rest of the the next video is going to be like uh, step one do this step two do this and in each step I'll cover all the all the different things that belongs to that step okay uh, for instance step one melt out the old babbit okay uh, what do you do after you do that well a, one of the things that you have to remember is Whenever you're melting out the old babbit, you don't just, just let it drip out. you got to get a clean wire brush and then scrape it all out, all the little bits of it in the nooks and crannies and in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, dovetail joints that might be in there, in the, in the holes that might have been drilled. you got to try and get something to get it out of there so that the good babbit can go back into those depressions and holes and and uh, dovetail joints and uh, not have any stuff that gets uh, burned up and turned into oxides, okay? The old stuff, if it's stuck in there, it's going to be, you know, small enough to where all it'll do is just turn into an oxide because of the heat and then you're going to have, uh, you know, defective crap down inside your good babbit, okay? So, and you can't have anything on your wire brushes because what you're trying to do after you after you uh, melt out the old babbit is you, you're trying to get this surface ready to be tinned. And it won't be tinned if you've got stuff on it like grease and oil 
uh, and you have uh, <clears throat> maybe a iron oxide in there somewhere as part of a you know it was a it was a defect in the casting as they made the uh, as they made the bearing shell you know you got to get as clean as possible what I did in the past is that once we cl you know cleaned out the bearing shell and uh, you know melted out the old Babbitt which there you know it's not like tons and tons of material you're only talking Oh, let's see if I can find something as an example. I don't have anything here as an example. If my coffee cup was empty, I could use that. Okay, let's say, let's say I'm, I got something here, and it's not going to be in this shape by any means. You know, they're usually they're round. Uh, if I have something in here, it's got a Babbitt lining. The Babbitt lining might not be any thicker than this. Okay? It might be, well, this is finished. This is a little bit thicker. It might be just barely thicker than that. It's not going to be this this thick, you know, unless it's a huge bearing. All right, if it's a small bearing, a bearing, let's say for a shaft or something about that big around, it's only going to have enough bearing material about so big. And so hence the reason why if you lose the oil inside that bearing, uh, that bearing material gets gets melted and 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 pulls away from the bearing shell and you you know then you've got to repair it okay so the first step melt out the old bearing material and clean the bearing shell now as I was about to say what I did used to do uh, what I did do in the past is that once I got the old babbitt off the bearing shell and and wiped it all you know all the tin interface off of there also I would put that in a sandblaster, okay? The sandblaster, what it did is it anything that, that was still you know on there would blow that away, but if there were any oxides in there, that would eat that away too. It'd blow it away like a sandstorm uh, etching into the side of a, of a house. It, was, it would take that oxide out, and it would be that much easier for you to uh, tin the bearing shell, okay? Now the next uh, the next uh, lecture or video video I keep on to say lecture the next video will cover start uh, step number one through the end on uh, re you know repairing a bearing shell okay uh, I wish I had a bearing that I could uh, you know actually do each step all right uh, while it might make for a longer video or a, a multi-section video, uh, that would be much, I would love it more to be able to show you exactly what to do. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's, you know, my showing you on, on, on my whiteboard or my, sh my telling you the s different steps, I guess that'll have to do. Okay. So until next time, uh, if you have any questions, please ask the questions, uh, you know, on the, in the uh, little comments area. And uh, press like or dislike or whatever you like, or whatever you want. But I'll do my best uh, in the next, let's say, week to get the second half done. And uh, I hope you uh, learn something from it. See you later.